to 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel 11, verses 1 through 5, contains our text. Second Samuel 11, verse 1, this is God's holy word. Then it happened in the spring, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the sons of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David stayed at Jerusalem. Now when evening came, David arose from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful in appearance. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her And when he came to her, he lay with her. And when she had purified herself from her uncleanness, she returned to her house. And the woman conceived. And she sent and told David and said, I am pregnant. The revelation of the living God. Amen. Amen. Be seated, please, and let's pray together. Oh, Lord, we seek your face. We seek you in your word. We come, oh, Lord, longing, desiring to be confronted, to be changed by the living word of God. We ask, oh, Lord, that you'd be pleased to, by the Spirit's help and power and His strength in us to lead us in the way of your truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One of the Bible's most penetrating analyses of sin was penned by the Apostle James. Chapter 1, verses 13 to 15 of his epistle. In verse 13, James emphatically denies that God is the author of sin. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. And then in verse 14 and 15, our Lord's half-brother pinpoints the launching point of sin in the sinner himself. Each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own desire. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. the gravity of those words, what they say, what the way that they speak to the sinful nature that resides in every one of us, the nature that affects our, the way we think, affects our affections, our emotions, affects our will. And James' words are a fitting commentary on the account of David's sin with Bathsheba, which shows that sin doesn't just somehow happen, but is rather the consequence of temptation and sinful desire. 
Now, the narrator wants us to see David. He wants us to see the David of chapter 11, verses 1 to 5, in stark contrast to the David of chapter 9, verses 1 to 3, and 10, verses 1 and 2. I meant to read those. Uh, I'll read them now. Then David said, Is there yet anyone left in the house of Saul that I may show him chesed, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Then in chapter 10, it happened... Uh, verse 1, it happened afterwards that the king of the Ammonites died, and Han and his son became king in his place. And then David said, I will show chesed, I will show kindness to Hanan, the son of Nabash, just as his father has shown kindness to me. The narrator wants us to see the David of chapter 11, verses 1 through 5, in contrast to the David of of chapter 9, verses 1 to 3, and 10, verses 1 and 2. In the David of chapter 11, verses 1 through 5, there is no chesed. There is no kindness. There is no faithfulness. These early verses uh, of, of chapter 11 show that it's not Chesed, it's not kindness, it's not faithfulness that drives David. It's his lust. The tone of the text, if we step back and we evaluate the text in terms of the way it's structured, the tone of the text is set by the verbs that the narrator uses. The action is quick, the verbs rush as David's passion rushes in the account. In verse 3, David sent and inquired. In verse 4, he sent and took. Then in verse 5, Bathsheba gets some verbs. She returned and conceived. She sent and told David. The action is stark. There's no conversation. There's no hint of caring or affection or love, only lust. David doesn't even call her by name in the text. He doesn't speak to her. And at the end of the encounter, she's only the woman. The verb that describes the outcome of these first five verses is conceived. But the telling verb is he took her. This account of David's sin with Bathsheba reveals the causes that conspired him, that conspired to make him vulnerable to temptation and desire, and the course that sin typically takes. We're shown here in the account of David's sin with Bathsheba the causes that conspired to make him vulnerable to temptation and desire and the course that sin typically takes. Those are the two things that we'll deal with tonight. The cause of sin and the course of sin. As we analyze the causes of David's sin in this text, the first cause is suggested by the first verse of our text. And David, happen, it happened rather in the spring that at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel and they destroyed the sons of Ammon, Ammon rather and besieged Rabbah but David stayed at Jerusalem. The first cause of David's sin is his neglect of his duty. The setting of verse 1 is the ongoing Ammonite war. Remember, uh, that was left hanging in chapter 10 and verse 14 when the Ammonites uh, retreated into uh, the fortified walls of their city. Uh, the war will come to an end at the conclusion of chapter 12. But here David sends Joab and his army and all Israel to, to war against the Ammonites. 
And in this first verse, the narrator pointedly refers to spring as the time that kings go out to battle. That was characteristic of kings, apparently. In case we didn't know that, the narrator informs us that especially during the springtime, the time that we enjoy as the most beautiful time of the year, perhaps, uh, depending on where we live, I suppose, but it was the springtime when everything was blooming uh, and otherwise uh, would be happy for us, kings went out and made war with, with other nations. It's a description, this time when kings went out to battle, that conflicts with the reality that David did not go out to battle but instead sent Joab to command all Israel. While the king stayed behind in Jerusalem, Joab and the army of Israel destroyed the sons of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. 1 Samuel 8.20 implies that leading the army out to battle was a part of the king's job description. And David is found in the spring when kings go out to battle, shirking that duty. By framing the background of David's sin in this way, the Holy Spirit shows us that omission typically precedes commission. In other words, Failing to carry out all that God requires of us typically precedes the breaking of God's commandments. An extra biblical but biblically accurate proverb expresses this first cause of David's sin like this idle hands. You know how that phrase goes idle hands, the devil's workshop. One of the best ways for us to guard against the temptation to sin is to keep busy in the work to which God has called us. Our lives should be devoted to faithfulness in all of our callings, whatever callings they may be, in the church, in society, in family. We should be busy seeking to give God glory in everything that our hand finds to do. One of the best ways to maintain fidelity in marriage, for example, is to remain faithful to our duties as husbands and wives, zealously pursuing a close, loving companionship with our spouses. It's especially important for Christians to maintain the duties of their devotion to Christ, including regular involvement in a faithful church, in the use of the means of grace, privately, in our families, and in corporate worship. In contrast to this, in contrast to a faithful execution of duties, David attended to his desires. John Calvin comments on this first verse, saying, By sparing himself and staying in his house in order to be at his ease, David threw himself into the net of Satan. And one evil fed another. In the first place, David, uh, David's sin then arose from a neglect of his duty. Secondly, David's sin arose from lustful desire. That was James' emphasis from the text that I read. Each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own desire. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And having followed David through the course of the Samuel narratives, if we had to take a stab at where David would be most vulnerable to sin, I think this is where we would point the finger. David in his polygamy, opened him up to the gratification of unrestrained lust. So that instead of being satisfied with one wife, he became greedier 
and lawless before God. He'd followed the worldly practice of kings, which contradicted God's marriage manual in Genesis 2, where the Lord's explicit instruction is that a man and a woman should be joined together as one flesh so that the two become one. And it doesn't appear that, that David was even conscious of the danger in which he had involved himself by multiplying wives, or was even aware of the command against, uh, against it that God gave through Moses in Deuteronomy 17, 17, imprinted it upon the law of Moses that a king was not to multiply wives. Given his pattern of desiring women more and more, and more women, David should have been taking steps to restrain his vulnerability rather than giving it increased scope. How does a Christian do this? How do we, how do we restrain? How do we put our vulnerability in check? Remember Paul urges believers not to indulge in promiscuity and sensuality, but to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh, that is, the sinful nature, with regard to its lusts. Note the two-step process of putting on and putting off. It tells us we... we we're not alone in this process, that we put on Christ, and we put on Christ through the means that Christ has given us, and we put on Christ through the grace that God gives us in Christ. And then there's a putting off. We shun evil, we put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And given the human body and its susceptibility to sexual sin, the, the apostle exhorts the Corinthians to flee immorality. It's interesting the way he characterizes uh, immorality there. He says, every other sin is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. The immoral man destroys himself when he sins in the sin of immorality. And Timothy Paul to Timothy, flee youthful lusts. Notice the three imperatives in Paul's instruction from these passages. Put on Christ. Avoid circumstances of temptation. And flee when you encounter those circumstances. Run like mad. Run away from sin. Paul says, flee it. Don't stay around. Separate yourself from it. Get away from it. The same need to combat sinful desires applies in other areas of tendency and temptation. Those who are prone to the boastful pride of life. Those who are prone to boasting about themselves. Uh, those who are prone to bitterness. Those who are prone to gossip should apply the scriptures to their thinking, their speech, to guard themselves from sin. David's sin with Bathsheba arose out of these two causes, primarily, our text tells us. It's not only that they arose from these uh, causes, the the neglect of his duty and his lustful desire, but they also followed a course or a progression that's typical of sinful behavior. And that brings us then secondly to the course of sin. And the course of sin is, is revealed in our text in the verbs we mentioned in the introduction. He saw, he sent, he took. The first step in David's sin involved his eyes. Verse 2, he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. 
Uh, You notice the descriptive. You notice the drawing influence. She was very beautiful in appearance. The very first sin recorded in human history began with Eve's not only listening to the serpent, but also gazing on what God had forbidden. She saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired. The Bible clearly implies in these passages that we are not to gaze on what God has forbidden. If we gaze on the things that God has banned and allow forbidden desire to to seep into our hearts, the lust of our eyes will pull us into sin like a powerful magnet. Television, movies, magazines, the internet, and other visual media forms have normalized sexual sin in our society. By watching or looking at sin We're desensitized to evil, and our desires are inflamed. And Christians must be aware of this. They must be aware not only that indulging in sin through these visual forms violates God's law, but also that these things are a means of entrapping us in sin and ultimately in destroying us if God is not gracious. Pornography, such an ugly word, so ugly that I hesitate to even use it in the pulpit. Pornography is categorized by neuthetic or biblical counselors as a life-dominating sin along with other sins like alcohol abuse and drug abuse. What do they mean? It means that uh, they mean that, that things like pornography and those things to which we become addicted, whether physically or psychologically, these begin to dominate our lives. They begin to control our lives. And if the studies I've read about pornography are accurate, not only men, but more and more women are being dominated by this sin. And so I plead with anyone in the hearing of this sermon, anyone here, anyone listening, live streaming, or uh, by means of... uh, recorded audio, if you've been entrapped by pornography, if you have become enslaved to pornography, I urge you to seek first the grace of Christ. There is absolutely, it's absolutely impossible. It's impossible to escape life-dominating sins apart from the grace of Christ. There is nothing Dear Christians, that will free us from the dominance of these kinds of sins, but the grace of Jesus Christ alone and the means of grace that he's provided. Is that not why it's so important for us to be faithful to the duty, our commitment to the means of grace, putting on Jesus Christ in the means of grace sucking up all the nourishment of of the grace that God gives us in his word, in prayer, and in the sacraments. But if you talk to a, a, a biblical counselor, a neuthetic counselor, neuthetic simply means to admonish. It's a, it's a Greek term for admonishment. And so biblical counselors admonish people from the scriptures. It's a It's a term that's used to show what biblical counselors do. If you talk to one of those counselors, they will tell you that ordinarily, 
it's, it's not possible to be free from life-dominating sins apart from accountability. That's another means of grace. That's not a man-made means. It's a God-made means. A brother or sister, sister or brother, husband or wife, church member or minister or elder coming into this accountability relationship. So I'm pleading, I'm urging anyone under the hearing of this sermon in any form that if you are if you've been entrapped by, by this such a life-dominating sin, you seek accountability. You seek the grace of Christ because apart from the grace of Christ, there's no hope for ever being released from such a sin. But you seek accountability through your pastor, or your elder, or your spouse. You start there. Well, having allowed... Uh, his eyes to to gaze on Bathsheba, David was taken in. He saw from the roof, and that's the first step in the course of sin, visual sin. That's why Isaiah spoke of blessing for he who shuts his eyes from looking on evil, Isaiah 33, 15. And it's why David in better days prayed that God would turn his eyes from looking at worthless things, Psalm 119, verse 37. Having allowed his eyes to gaze on Bathsheba's beauty, the king took a second step in his sin. Verse 3, David sent and inquired about the woman. And by sending to inquire about this woman, this woman that he had seen with his eyes, this woman who was quite beautiful in appearance, he opened up the floodgates of opportunity. He opened up the opportunity to act on sinful desire, that desire that has risen in his, had arisen in his heart. Calvin describes David here as nourishing his wicked desire instead of resisting it as he should have done. And when his servants returned... Verse 3, identifying the woman as Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, two things in their report should have awakened him to the stranglehold that this sin already had on him. It should have restrained him from carrying on his sinful desire any, any farther. In the first place, Bathsheba was married. And all sexual intimacy outside of marriage is forbidden in the seventh commandment. You mark that and you mark it well. Children, the young, all sexual intimacy outside of marriage is forbidden. Marriage is the context in which we are as Christians to express our sexual intimacy with our spouse alone. It's especially heinous to commit adultery with someone who's married. Remember what the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 13 and verse 4, the marriage bed is not to be defiled. Not to mention that it should have reminded David of his own bonds of obligation in marriage. And since he had multiplied wives, he had multiple reminders of that obligation. So she was married, but secondly, both Bathsheba's father, Eliam, and her husband, Uriah the Hittite, were members of David's elite bodyguard and were at the present time when David was committing this sin, fighting on his behalf against the Ammonites, Israel's sworn enemy. How egregious it was for David to ignore the debt of loyalty that he owed to these men. There's no chesed here. There's no faithfulness to these men and those bonds of loyalty. There's no faithfulness to his wives 
Paul gave directions to believers who find themselves in temptation's grip, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. Some of you have memorized it. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man, and God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also. What is that way of escape? How do we escape the grip of temptation once we are drawn into that temptation? Well, in the first place, our Lord has given us instructions in the prayer that we call the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Keep us from temptation. Keep us away, O God, we ought to be praying. Keep us away from circumstances in which we will be tempted, in which we will fall into temptation. But when we are tempted, O Lord, by your powerful grace, deliver me from that temptation. So my question for you is, are you praying that prayer? Children and the young, young men, young ladies, are you praying the Lord's Prayer in your devotions? You should be. You should be dealing with all of those aspects of, of the Lord's Prayer in your prayers. But in particular now, I'm asking you, are you praying that God won't lead you into temptation? But if he does, that by his grace, he would deliver you from evil. That goes for adults too. We ought to be praying this prayer on a regular basis, praying for the Lord's grace. But then secondly, we should be following the Westminster Larger Catechism's direction to improve our baptism. What does that mean, children? What does it mean? That, uh, can we improve upon anything that, that God, is, uh, who is perfect, has, has given to us as an ordinance in the church, as a sacrament in the church? No, not at all. It means that we should seek to come to a better understanding of our baptism, that we should meditate on the efficacy, uh, the power of the sacrament, and, and it's, it's work in us all our lives, not just at the moment of its administration, but the catechism says, especially in times of temptation, doesn't it? So are you using your baptism? That's the second question I have for you. Are you praying that prayer, lead, us not, lead me not into temptation, but deliver, deliver me from evil? And are you, are you using your baptism? As a defense, who would have ever thought that our baptism would be a defense against sin? But the writers of, of the framers of the larger catechism say that it is, and they're right. Because that sign and that seal reminds us of all that we are in Christ. It reminds us that, we're, uh, that, that we have been freed from sin by Christ. It reminds us that we've been taken into the family of God and we, we have a heavenly father. We don't like to disappoint our earthly fathers with our misbehavior. We shouldn't. How much more should we dread disappointing, grieving our heavenly father and his Holy Spirit? Martin Luther wrote some things that, about Satan and the kinds of things that he said to Satan that I can't repeat in polite company, let alone from the pulpit. But one of the things that he said is something that we ought to try to practice. When he was tempted, Luther said, get away from me, devil. I've been baptized. That's how we use our baptism. And I'm sure that when Martin Luther as as thorough a theologian as he was, when he, prayed, when he said that, he wasn't just thinking, get away, devil, I'm a baptized Christian. No, he was thinking about the efficacy of that baptism. 
So we should use those things. Use the things that God, the means that God has, has given us. Baptism, that's a means of grace, isn't it? That's one way to improve your baptism. David not only saw, he not only sent, but finally, verse 4, he took. He was driven by his lust. He was enabled by his power. David trampled God's law. He cast aside his bonds of loyalty. All so that he could indulge in the sexual passions that he had permitted to run wild in his mind and in his heart. David was mastered by his sinful desires and Bathsheba was mastered by his royal power. What choice did she really have? Think about it. Could she have refused when the king sent for her? Could she have refused? I suppose she could have. Can you imagine the consequences if she had refused to go to the king when the king summoned her? Whatever David may have intended to do on the roof that evening, we may confidently conclude that the Lord did not exalt him to the lofty perch of his palace. He didn't raise him to the throne over Israel so that he might use his power to indulge himself in the pleasures that belong to others. Lord Acton's proverb says, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. The kings of old had nothing if not absolute power. And David was nothing if not corrupted by his kingly power. Considering the cause, the, these causes and the course of David's sin, we should be struck. This is an awful text. We should be struck by the awful rapidity of David's sin. He fell so quickly in these rapid succession, a rapid succession of, of actions. He fell. This is the man after God's own heart. 1 Samuel 13, verse 14. This is the man who was raised on high, anointed by the God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel. 2 Samuel 23, verses 1 and 2. God's chosen king, through whom God propagated the covenant of grace and all of its glorious promises. How suddenly and how ruinously Any of Christ's servants can fall. There's a sentiment expressed in Robert Robinson's hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, that sounds a warning blast to be heeded by every Christian because it rings true for every Christian. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. According to one account of Robinson's life, that sentiment wasn't merely a remote possibility. But it became a distinct distinct reality for Robert Robertson. He'd been converted under George Whitfield's preaching in 1752. He later became a Baptist minister in Cambridge. But toward the end of his life, he had again, according to this account of his life, given way to frivolous habits. 
And during this period, he was traveling by stagecoach when another passenger persistently referred to that hymn, Come Thou Found. She said, she, she mentioned to him persistently again and again how much blessing that hymn had brought to her life. When she continued at length, Robinson became so agitated that he burst out, Madam, I am the poor unhappy man who composed that hymn many years ago. And I would give a thousand worlds if I had them to enjoy the feelings that I had then. Don't look at David's sin with Bathsheba and say, I could never do such a thing. It's not within the realm of possibilities for me. If you do, you've already taken the precarious spiritual posture that Paul warns Christ's servants against. 1 Corinthians 10, let he who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Never be surprised at what you're capable of as a fallen sinner. The only safe ground is to pray with Robert Robinson in the words of that hymn, O oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let that grace now, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. God's servants fall. Don't be surprised when they do. Only recently, a long-standing minister was deposed from the ministry. A man that I've met, a man that I know, due to sexual sin. Don't be surprised. But when God's servants fall, or when you fall into egregious sin, sin of a more heinous nature, take encouragement in God's persevering grace. I love this passage in Psalm 37. I learned it in a scripture song at a church I attended when I was a young man in the United States Navy. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he will not be cast down, for the Lord upholds him in his hand. Thank God for his persevering grace in us. A grace that never gives up, no matter how greatly we grieve his spirit. Thank God for a God who walks alongside of us, who strengthens us against our sin. For a Christ who has conquered sin and death on our behalf and has freed us, removed the chains created a definitive breach between us and sin so that we no longer necessarily have to sin. And give thanks for David's son, David's Lord, who was tempted in all things, just as we are, yet without sin so that we might have his righteousness, so that his righteous obedience should be given to us when we trust in him and him alone. What a wondrous, what a beautiful thing, you see. My standing before God isn't dependent on my behavior as a Christian. My standing before God does not depend on my faithfulness in walking before him, though I should, with all that is within me, strive against sin. 
That doesn't determine my acceptance before him. That's grace. Let's pray. Our gracious God in heaven, we humble ourselves before you. We know our hearts. We know our sin. You know our sin better than we know. You know sins that we've committed that we're not even aware that we've committed. But, oh, Lord, we're thinking now especially of those heinous sins, those sins that are more heinous than others, but you clearly teach us uh, that, uh, that, that there are in the scriptures we, we come and we plead for you that you would, by your grace, uphold us. By your power, O oh Lord, strengthen us against sin. Use the means of grace. Uh, we haven't even been faithful in those things, O oh Lord. We haven't been faithful in uh, the private or the fam familial or, or the corporate use of the means of grace. And, and yet, O oh Lord, we come as, as beggars with nothing in our hands. And we pray. that you would keep us from falling. And that when we fall, you would uphold us. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.